Welcome to this presentation of the Kennel Club Breed Standard for the Bedlington Terrier. Prepared by the Midland Bedlington Terrier Club in collaboration with the National Bedlington Terrier Club and with acknowledgements to the Kennel Club for their permission to use the breed standard. Our intention is to explain and illustrate the Bedlington Terrier breed standard to encourage judges to understand, interpret and apply the correct principles and attributes when judging our breed and to help owners, breeders and exhibitors to get a better understanding of how the breed developed and why the standard has been drawn up and amended over the years to emphasise the Bedlington's fitness for function. Judges and breeders should bear the standard in mind at all times to ensure the qualities of the Bedlington are maintained and we have used a combination of photographs, videos and illustrations to help visualise the breed standard. We hope that you find this useful. We have taken the decision to not include examples of faults as we believe everyone should be certain of the correct attributes and the correct images should be the ones we all concentrate on and remember. We would like to thank all who contributed to this presentation, the Midland Bedlington Terrier Club, the National Bedlington Terrier Club, Theresa Middlebrook for preparing this presentation, Viv Rainsbury for illustrations, the Kennel Club for the use of the breed standard and, above all, the dogs themselves for taking part with such good grace. The Bedlington Terrier A Brief History of the Breed It is difficult to produce an entirely accurate history of this native British breed, as early details are sketchy and have relied on word of mouth rather than formal records. But the Bedlington Terrier as we know it today has been in existence since the mid-1800s. However, a strain of rough-coated terriers was recorded in the area around the Rothbury Forest in Northumberland from the late 18th century, which became known as the Rothbury Terrier, or sometimes the Northern Counties Rough Fox Terrier, which gives an indication of their purpose. These were game, spirited dogs, used for poaching, sport and vermin control, and were required to hunt and go to ground for fox and badger, otter, rat and rabbit, again suggesting why some of the present-day Bedlington traits, characteristics and physical attributes are what they are. No doubt too, the Bedlington-owning miners of Northumberland also indulged in terrier racing and wages in the rat pit. This diversity of activity goes some way to explaining why the Bedlington's distinctive shape developed and why the breed is unlike any other terrier. The geography of the area where the breed was developed also played a part in which attributes were prized and encouraged. Northumberland, England's most northerly county, has a diverse physical geography. To the east, towards the North Sea, it is low and flat. Further west, the terrain becomes increasingly mountainous and craggy, with a mix of granite, lava and limestone soils. The Bedlington, therefore, was required to work across a variety of landscapes, and needed the tenacious, tough and robust temperament required of a versatile working terrier. The earliest authentic record of the Bedlington Terrier as we have come to know it is of a dog called Old Flint, whelped in or around 1782 and owned by Squire Trevelyan of Netherton Hall near Morpeth in Northumberland. Old Flint's descendants were recorded throughout the early 19th century and the name Bedlington Terrier is attributed to Joseph Ainsley around 1840, although the breed also continued to be known as the Rothbury Terrier until the 1870s. By the 1890s, dogs of a recognisable Bedlington type, such as James Anderson's Piper, were described as slender build, 15 inches high, 15 pounds in weight, liver colour with hair like hard woolly lint. Their ears were large, hung close to the cheek, and were slightly feathered at the tip. Edward Coates Phoebe, whose pedigree can be loosely traced back to Old Flint, was black or black-blue, with a light-coloured silky tuft on her head, about 13 inches high, weighing in at 14 pounds. These dogs were capable of going to ground on fox, now restricted to the protection of game birds, or badger, 100% illegal for many years, which required a game terrier with an exceptionally strong jaw and neck and flexible body. Bigger, stronger dogs were needed for badger, which explains some of the variation in size still seen today. 
A ratting dog needs super fast reflexes, speeding turning and a keen eye. For rabbits, a good nose allows a dog to mark an occupied warren so the rabbit knows where to place his nets. And patience, good hearing and a keen eye allows the dog to pounce and snatch the occasional rabbit flushed out by a ferret. Bedlingtons can also flush rabbits from dense undergrowth and they work successfully alongside lurchers and sight hounds, which are better equipped for coursing and catching the rabbits. The basic construction and attitude of the Bellington Terrier has changed only a little over the years, although some of the feisty nature has been moderated. Trimming and presentation has changed substantially. However, judges must be careful to reward the dogs which are fit for the purpose they were originally developed for, and not be overly influenced by glamour and abundance of furnishings. Bedlingtons were first classified at the Darlington Show in 1866 and the Kennel Club recognised the breed in 1873. In the late 1800s the original Bedlington Terrier Club drew up a standard of points and in 1910 the National Bedlington Terrier Club formulated what appears to be the first breed standard. There have been a number of minor amendments to the standard to reach the present one which is explained and interpreted here. Points of the dog. It is important for potential judges to understand that understanding the points of the dog forms part of the Kennel Club's requirements. Skeleton of the dog. It is important for judges to understand the skeleton of the dog. The skeleton forms the structure of the dog and despite clever trimming the overall basic appearance is determined by the underlying structure. Please note, in the following sections the breed standard is shown in the left panel and the interpretation in the right. General Appearance The Bedlington is instantly recognisable and his appearance suggests his general demeanour that of a dog who is active, athletic and capable of fulfilling his original purpose without problem. He is a dog developed to work as a hunter and still over 180 years since the breed was first recognised, should retain the appearance of a dog which can fulfil that purpose. He must appear capable of working in all conditions, on different terrains, fast and supple enough to do the job with as little expense to himself as possible. The trimming of the head should follow the underlying shape of the skull and not over-exaggerate the contours. Bedlingtons have an expression often described as sleepy whilst the dog is relaxed. His expression indicates that he is not a dog who will go looking for trouble unnecessarily. However, this gentleness can be replaced in an instant by a flashing look verging on fire when the dog is roused. Characteristics A Bedlington who is shy, nervous or who hides away does not display the normal attitude and behaviour of the breed. The breed's intelligence makes him biddable and easy to train, but his underlying instinct is nevertheless that of a hunter, and a Bedlington may take himself off hunting, not coming back until he is ready. Temperament This is a dog who is quick to learn, and has great affinity with his people and most definitely not a shrinking violet. Bedlingtons make excellent family companions and will generally live happily with other dogs, cats and small animals when properly trained. They will accompany you on a long walk or sit happily by your side watching TV. Generally peaceful and not inherently an aggressive fighter, the Bedlington will not as a rule start a fight. However, he is more than willing to take on all comers if he feels that he, his people or his property is being threatened and will engage in skirmish if he feels the need is there. Whilst many Bellingtons are never called upon to work in the traditional manner, they should nevertheless have the intelligence and attitude to consider what needs to be done, then get on with it, rather than plunging into a situation without hesitation. Head and Skull 
The skull should be narrow and deep but not too refined as it has to anchor the powerful jaw which the breed needs to fulfil its original purpose. For example, to tackle prey, including fox and badger. Nowadays, such activities are largely illegal, but the Bedlington must still appear fit for function. The colour of the top knot will vary from a silvery white on blue dogs to a creamy white on livers and sandies. Any damage to the underlying skin, such as small tears from brambles, results in regrown hair coming back through as black or brown and should not be penalised unnecessarily. The jaw needs strength to accommodate large teeth and to allow the dog to grab and hold on to prey. The lower jaw also needs depth and strength to enable the dog to grip. The straight foreface gives a strength to the skull. The skull should be strong below the eye with no indentations and structural weaknesses. Loose flues would leave the dog open to damage from the biting jaws of prey. Nostrils should be large and open and not pinched. These enable the dog to breathe easily when he is biting and holding prey and when he is running. The images show a mature male with correct head showing a typical wedge shape with a long tapering jaw, well filled below the eye, and a young bitch with correct head with a profuse silky white top knot. Eyes The old standard referred to the eyes as deep set. To avoid any risk of eye problems this was amended some years ago. However the eyes should not be round or prominent as this would make them vulnerable to accidental injury. A skull well filled under the eye helps achieve the correct shape. The eyes can be an indicator of the dog's attitude. Temperament has been described as mild in repose and this can be seen in the Bedlington's relaxed, sleepy expression. However, when roused, the eyes sparkle with fire, showing the dog's courageous outlook. However, the expression should not be that of a hard, beady-eyed look. Note. Dark eye rims part of the requirement for darker pigmentation can make the eye appear too big or round. The images show a well-shaped eye with the appearance of being triangular. Ears Filbert refers to a variety of hazelnut, cobnut, which has a slightly pointed oval shape at its tip and wider at the base. A filbert paintbrush also echoes the shape. See image on the left. Ears should feel thin and fine, not thick and fleshy. Some dogs may carry a ridge of thick cartilage down the length of the ear. Current grooming practices often include shaving off the hair completely from the ear and the requirement for a covering of fine hair and velvety texture is overlooked. Leaving a heavy tassel or pom-pom at the tip is also an exaggeration of the requirement for a fringe of silky hair. This may detract from the idea that the Bedlington is a sporting breed. Well set ears, front in line with the outer corner of the eye. Correct shapes and hanging close to the cheek. It's generally accepted that the front corner of the ear should be on level with the outer corner of the eye. Whilst the ear should be fine enough to lie flat down the side of the face, Bedlingtons will use their ears when their interest is roused. And the back outer edge may be held away from the head, giving the dog an alert look. Mouth The numbers in brackets indicate the number of teeth in each side of the jaw, 42 teeth in total. Without a good mouth, with strong teeth and a scissor bite, the dog would not be able to tackle its original prey. The scissor bite allows a dog to grip and the big teeth mean a powerful bite. A level or pincer bite where the edges of the teeth meet rather than overlap can result in a shock when the teeth snap together and could cause the dog to lose its grip and result in injury. Small teeth in a weak jaw means the dog is not fit for function. Neck The Bellington needs a good reach and muscular strength to its neck to enable it to do the job it was designed for, to catch and hold prey. 
loose skin around the throat would be vulnerable to injury from the jaws of fox and originally badger. The high head carriage of the Bedlington is an indicator of the dog's temperament, mood, attitude and confidence. Four quarters. Many long-standing breeders and exhibitors will refer to a horseshoe front. This doesn't mean a round-shaped iron shoe of a horse, but to the old-fashioned curved magnets with a rounded middle and long straight arms, which converge towards their ends, accurately describing the shape of the Bedlington's forequarters viewed from the front. The need for a front assembly which converges towards the feet may have something to do with the terrain the Bedlington was expected to work on. Whilst a straight front, the same width from chest to feet, gives greater stability whilst the dog is standing, but the convergence at the feet allows the dog to turn and twist on rough, uneven ground and move efficiently between rocks and crags. The bones of the front leg, however, must be straight and strong. They are not curved or bowed. The pastons are the shock absorbers of the front assembly and long, strong pastons allow the dog to turn, twist, leap and gallop. They also enable the light, lifting, springy movement, which is typical of the Bedlington. Shoulder angulation should not be exaggerated or the front legs will come too far under the body and inhibit speed, flexibility and manoeuvrability. A Bedlington with the correct front may turn out his front feet slightly when standing at rest. Providing all the bones are straight, this is acceptable. Body The Bedlington is designed for speed, agility and manoeuvrability, with the strength to work on a variety of terrains. A flattened ribcage allows the dog to get into small spaces, however this does not mean the dog should be narrow and slab-sided. The ribs need to spring away from the spine to give room for the heart and lungs to operate fully, then flatten inwards to the brisket to allow the forelegs to move freely. The arch is created by strong muscle over a slightly curved spine. It should not be an exaggerated curve with a high point over the top of the rib cage. A short coupled dog with insufficient length of back and loin is less flexible and unable to gallop at great speed. The length is measured from the point of the shoulder to the point of the buttock and the height is measured from the withers to the ground. Hind quarters. The description of the Bennington set out in 1839 stated, the thinner the hips the better. A 1910 breed standard asked for light quarters. For today's standard it is accepted that the quarters must not be over angulated and exaggerated or speed and agility will be compromised. The arch over the loin makes the hind legs look longer than the front legs. The length should not come from over-angulation or being over-long from stifle to hock or weakness results. Hocks need to be strong. Turning in or out results in weakness and poor movement. The inclusion of moderate turn of stifle was one of the last amendments to the breed standard following approaches by the breed clubs. Exaggerated bend of stifle affects the Bedlington's ability to turn, twist and accelerate preventing it from carrying out its original function. However, insufficient turn of stifle also leads to weakness and inhibits speed and agility. Feet The Bennington needs strong feet and thick pads to work over any terrain and when necessary to go to ground and dig. The Bennington Terrier appears on the Kennel Club's breed watch list, Points of Concern Category 2. Bedlingtons can suffer from a condition known as familial foot pad hyperkeratosis. Deep fissures and cracks, often the full depth of the pad exposing the flesh underneath, corns along sides of the pads and horny growths around the nails are indicators of this. The condition may not affect all feet and it is essential that judges examine every foot by looking and feeling at the pads. Tail the tail needs to follow line of spine in a gentle flowing curve. Tail carriage is often indicative of mood, 
and young dogs are particularly prone to raising their tails. When the dog is relaxed, the tail may often be carried between the legs. However, tail carriage isn't the same as tail set. Some dogs have a croup, pelvis, which sits too flat and angle, so the tail sticks out of the back rather than falls down in a gentle curve. Tails are more likely to be carried higher when the dog is on the move. Gait and movement. A correctly made, muscular, athletic and flexible dog will give this appearance. A dog which is too lightly built, short coupled, cobby or cloddy will not. The Bedlington should move lightly over the ground and not appear to be heavy and plodding. The front feet should converge but should not cross a central line. The hind legs and hocks should move parallel and not close or brushing. A mincing action, light and springy, describes movement which lifts the dog off the ground and drives forward. This allows the dog to move over uneven or rocky terrain. The dog needs strong sloping pasterns to do this and strong hocks. The movement should not be jerky and stilted as this wastes energy and is not economical. The dog needs effortless movement so as not to tire if out in the field all day. Correct angulation and good muscle tone is needed to lift the body and project it forward and the landing must be cushioned by strong shock absorber pastons. Convergence of the front feet and to a degree at the rear will give a slight roll when in full stride but the front legs should not plait or cross. Judges need to observe carefully to watch out for dogs which swing the pastons in, then flick them out, so the feet appear to land in the correct place. Judges also need to be aware that strong muscle on the second thigh can pull the lower hind pastons in on the move. This is not the same as being cowhocked or going close through incorrect conformation. A well-made Bedlington should hold a correct top line on the move and not flatten. The following pages include videos of correct movement. These clips show the correct hind movement, with the hind legs moving parallel, hocks turning neither in nor out. This is a young male who is carrying his tail a little high at times. This should not be unduly penalised as long as the tail set is correct. Males, particularly younger dogs, may often raise their tails as a communication signal. These clips show different dogs all displaying accurate front movement. The front feet are converging but at no point do the feet cross, either whilst the leg is in motion or when the feet land. The elbows are not thrown out away from the body and, on the first clip, when the dog is in full stride, the slight roll called for in the standard is evident. This clip shows the correct movement seen in profile. The dog is moving with a light springy step with lift created by driving from the hocks. The top line is held on the move with the muscular arch held correctly over the loin. Head carriage is good and the tail is carried in a gentle curve. Coat. An early standard of points rated coat as highly as head properties. A dog with a poor, thin, soft coat is unlikely to be able to withstand the rigours of working over or underground. The 1839 standard comments include a wool-like texture but hard. Traditionally, hunting in autumn and winter, when weather might be cold and wet with a stiff wind, a coat that isn't dense and weatherproof renders the dog less effective. The correct coat should be a mixture of softer, linty undercoat and harder, coarser guard hairs. The coat should be thick and stand well away from the skin. A thin coat without guard hairs will not be weatherproof. The dog with a poor coat will still work, enthusiasm and courage will keep him going, but he'll weaken sooner and take longer to recover. The coat, therefore, is an essential aspect of a dog fit for function. Current grooming and presentation practices can make this attribute difficult to find. Blaster dryers will straighten the coat, 
and the close clipping on the head and throat can disguise the texture and twist of the hair. In addition, the use of sprays, chalk and texturisers will alter the look and feel of the coat and make it difficult to assess, particularly on exhibits from overseas where preparation rules are different from our own. It is sometimes possible to determine the correct coat qualities by filling the coat across the croup and base of the tail. Soft fluffy coats should be discouraged. Colour Coat colour can change at different times of the year and can vary from paler coats to deep intense shades of grey or brown. Liver is a deep purplish brown. Sandy is a more golden brown and blues will vary from pale silver blue to deep charcoal. Pigment refers not only to coat but to nose, eye rims, lips and nails. It is sometimes easier to determine colour as puppies. Size Size is another very important feature when looking at the Bedlington's function. A dog which is too big will not be able to go to ground. Too small it may be able to go to ground but may not have the strength for close combat. Smaller dogs however can be useful to hold prey at bay, giving tongue whilst avoiding snapping jaws. Faults Please remember To maintain the integrity of the breed and to uphold the breed's fitness for function Judges should bear the following in mind. Select balanced animals which conform to the breed standard. Select animals which have good muscle tone, deep flat rib cage, a powerful jaw and which are flexible, muscular and athletic. Select animals which move freely with a light, effortless action. Do not reward exaggeration of any kind. Do not reward animals which are aggressive, shy or nervous. Do not reward animals which move with an exaggerated action, however eye-catching this may be. Do not be influenced by glamorous presentation at the expense of a soundly constructed animal. Terms of use The contents of this illustrated interpretation of the breed standard of the Bedlington Terrier are protected by copyright and may not be reproduced by any means without the written consent of the copyright holders.